All right. Well, um, you know, we've, we've already talked a lot about uh, the ethical issues. All three speakers um, have clearly had them in mind. I'm going to just uh, retrace some of that category uh, territory and, and raise a few more issues. So what are the ethical issues here? If you had to put them into two main bins, you would say, first of all, do they really work? Do, do, are these games effective? And that's an ethical issue just in the sense of, you know, are, uh, are people selling you what they claim to be selling you? Are you getting your money's worth? Um, are you wasting your time? Uh, working with a game that really isn't going to help you achieve whatever your therapeutic or personal improvement goal is. And then the other issue which we really uh, dove deeply into um, uh, just now is, you know, is it bad for people? Um, and I'm going to broaden that out a little bit beyond just the question of addiction to its effects on just, you know, general healthy people and society. But, um, oh, and uh, I want to echo the other speakers by saying, you know, all of these questions have to be framed um, relative to a specific game or type of game, a specific targeted ability, and a specific type of user. And again, you know, everybody before me has been careful to draw these distinctions. So, for example, um, you know, what, what's true for games that train attention or memory or executive function um, might not be true for games that uh, help with mood or train social skills or help desensitize people. In fact, even within these categories, you know, an attention uh, training game might work, but a memory training game might not, for example. Um, Similarly, with these more social emotional things, desensitization. Can you help somebody get over their phobia? Yes. Can you help uh, troops get over their pesky um, disinclination to kill people? You know, maybe not. Um, these, are, these are all uh, applications that uh, games are um, applied to. And then, in terms of the people that might be the users, um, they differ. Uh, by age and life stage um, among the healthy and um, among people with problems, clinical groups. Um, and again, even within each of these things, brain injured, what kind of brain injury, what part of the brain, um, prodromal for what. Um, so these are all, uh, this is, if you think of each of these terms as a dimension in a space, there's a really big space of possible games that we can evaluate the effectiveness of and um, the side effects of. So do they work? Well, I have to first disclose, I, I am not a gaming expert, in, and in fact, I don't even play them. I've never played one, <laughs> so, so I, am, I am the ultimate outsider here. Um, but let me say that I approach this uh, with a certain creed, with a certain uh, religious devotion to the church of agnosticism. Um, now, believe it or not, this really is a church somewhere in California, of course, of course. in a town called Normal Heights. Um, <laughs> and it's the church of agnosticism. So I do want to proceed with you know, an agnostic viewpoint as to the effectiveness. Um, it seems that there is some evidence that they work, but... Uh, there are a lot of buts here. First of all, a lot of the published trials are not of high quality. They, um, what they use as a placebo condition is often what, what's sometimes called a no contact control. So they have two groups of people. One, one group gets a pretest and then does the training and gets a post test. Some number of weeks later, the other it comes in, does the pretest, goes away, and comes back the same number of weeks later and does a post-test. And you can imagine all kinds of ways in which placebo effects would favor the group that's actually been doing something with the experimenters. Um, and even different types of experimental interventions could be more or less uh, you know, suggestive to people that they are going to improve. 
Um, I think an ideal kind of design, which has not been much used, would be um, two groups training two different psychological capacities um, with pre and post test for both of the um, capacities looking for a crossover. Another limitation of these trials is they tend to be rather low power, low statistical power, because they tend to have rather small samples. You know, you can't blame people. It costs a lot of money to, to recruit and screen and follow longitudinally big samples, but that does uh, limit our ability to know for sure whether these things are effective. Um, in addition, as everybody who's been following the, you know, discussions of the replicability crisis in the behavioral and neurosciences knows, isolated studies are hard to interpret. You can have a well-designed, good study carried out by an honest researcher that comes up with a positive result, but actually it just doesn't replicate for any one of a number of reasons. So, um, you know, ideally we would look to meta-analyses Meta-analysis is not a panacea, it's got its own problems, but the meta-analyses that I know of in the realm of uh, brain training games, in working memory training, in any case where I think the most experimental work has been done, has not been very encouraging. Um, so uh, the results of meta-analyses, certainly for training working memory to increase uh, cognitive abilities more generally, fluid intelligence, um, uh, the meta-analyses have told us no, um, there, there is no effect. Okay, um, another reason that it's hard to really know whether these things work is that many of the leading researchers in this field have vested interests. They're also associated with companies. Now, as, as Adam has said, I mean, you know, he is not, he, he takes himself off of the research team that's doing these things. I also want to say that, you know, just having a vested interest doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Um, and in fact, if you're a researcher and you, you know, uh, totally with, with no bias at all, arrive at the conclusion that these systems are really effective and can really help people, then you will try to commercialize them, and you will try to get them more widely used and uh, generally associate yourself with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, company that will now mean you have a, a vested interest. So it isn't necessarily like a, a sign of anything nefarious, but, but it is a problem. Another big question is the generalizability of the gains. Um, Adrian Owen made a big splash a few years ago um, by uh, publishing the results, I think it was in, was it in Nature, um, of you know, a huge number of subjects on a bunch of different tests. And what he found was, not surprisingly, people do get better at performing the exact same tasks that they're practicing for weeks and weeks. That would be kind of newsworthy if it wasn't found almost, you know. Um, then, but the question is, do they get better at other tasks that test the same abilities and more, like, you know, a different kind of a working memory task? And most importantly, do they get better at tasks that have some real world relevance? Um, and uh, by and large, there's, I, I don't believe there are any, um, I don't believe that the literature as a whole uh, gives a resounding positive answer to that question yet. And finally, just r remind you that, you know, you can show that one type of game for one type of user is effective, but it might not be uh, the case with other games or other users. So um, against the background of all of this uncertainty, um, very recently, just a month ago, less than a month ago, um, a group of researchers uh, organized jointly by Stanford and the Max Planck Institute in Germany, um, convened, uh, well, I don't know if they convened, but they <laughs> brought together online, <laughs> um, ubiquitous theme that that is, a, um, a group of leading scientists, including Adam, um, 
And uh, the scientists all signed a statement saying that there is currently no persuasive evidence that these brain training games are helpful to, um, to elders who want to um, protect or reverse the effects of cognitive aging. And, um, um, oh, I see, I do have the, the cheat sheet here. So I'll, I'll read you their um, executive summary. We object to the claim that brain games offer consumers a scientifically grounded avenue to reduce or reverse cognitive decline when there is no compelling scientific evidence to date that they do. The promise of a magic bullet, whoops, okay. Uh, the promise of a magic bullet detracts from the best evidence to date, which is that cognitive health in old age reflects the long-term effects of healthy, engaged lifestyles. And by engaged, they don't mean with a computer screen, they mean with activities in the community, friends, family, etc. In the judgment of the signatories, exaggerated and misleading claims exploit the anxiety of older adults about impending cognitive decline. We encourage continued careful research and validation in this field. So although it's a, you know, basically a fairly negative statement, there's, there's nothing there at this point, um, they are not saying there's nothing there and there never will be, but they're saying we just don't know enough right now to say. Um, okay, so what about the other, um, the other ethical question. If the first ethical question is, are we really getting our money's worth? Are we selling people snake oil? The answer is, well, we don't know yet. It might be snake oil. Um, what about if they do work, that means they could have positive effects, but if they're effective, they can have negative effects too. Or even if they don't have positive effects, they could have negative effects. What about that? Well, um, you know, obviously, um, uh, Mark, Mark Griffiths um, took you through the evidence that for a small segment of the population, they can have very negative effects indeed, and I won't repeat that uh, information, but I would like to point you to some broader issues. Issues about the rest of us, okay? The, those of us and our kids um, who are into these games, you know, what is it, what is it doing to us? Um, I'm going to point out some interesting lessons from three different books, um, all written by people who could be considered in the field of science and technology studies, um, basically uh, anthropologists, historians who study science, technology, and its effects on society. The first one is by Sherry Turkle, um, a sociologist and psychoanalyst um, by training who has written a series of books over the years about the relationships, oh my goodness, of um, people and computers. And her first several books, starting in the 80s, um, were, were quite balanced, um, and if anything, kind of positive. She views um, computers as very much changing how we live and who we are, but not in bad ways, they just make us different, they make life different. But her most recent book, Alone Together, it comes down a little more on the negative side of this balance and says, um, you know, the, the, uh, the way in which we are so focused, so much of our day on computers and online activity in general, and again, following Mark, it's not all the same thing. Gaming isn't the same as, you know, Facebook, whatever. But I think particularly gaming is, can be isolating. Um, and she thinks this is really eroding human relationships, social skills, and so forth. A very interesting book about the history of drugs in society by David Courtright points out that, um, and I think you know, there are a lot of um, uh, analogies between games and drugs here, that compared to the nice chess game that uh, you know, Ben Franklin was talking about, um, 
Today's games are optimized to be fully engaging with exactly the right timing, and as all of our speakers talked about, the, the right activity level, uh, the, right, the, the right difficulty level, the sweet spot to really keep you engaged. And I want to make an analogy between the online games and, um, the, uh, and drugs that takes off from David Courtwright's fact, uh, point about drugs. He says, that um, basically differences in degree of potency can almost amount to differences in kind. So he says that the production of spirits and fortified wines exacerbated drunkenness and alcoholism in both European and non-European societies. He writes, distilled drinks were to fermented drinks what guns were to bows and arrows. Um, and similar points for coccolis versus cocaine versus amphetamine, you know, uh, heroin to uh, morphine and so forth. And I think the same thing may be true um, with these games that are really designed, sometimes with the help of neuroscience, to just um, to keep us hooked. Um, and the final, uh, the final book is a book, in fact, called Addiction by Design. Um, by an anthropologist in uh, science and technology studies at MIT, um, Natasha Shul, who talks about the ways in which these games are optimized to be just uh, overwhelmingly um, addictive, uh, much more so than conventional uh, games of chance, slot machines, et cetera. So policy uh, recommendations, uh, not one size fits all, um, different kinds of games for different purposes, need different levels of uh, regulation. Um, if you're trying to uh, put kids with ADHD onto a game system to help them improve their attention, it's a lot more important that that be right than if you are, I don't know, you know, imagine a more kind of fanciful and op optional thing. I also just want to um, say that Policy does not mean legislation. There are lots of ways that we can shape the, the uptake, the, the formation and the uptake of games by society um, that can maximize benefit, minimize harm, uh, that are not um, making laws. Thank you.